thank you for coming. I'm Paul Stack. I'm the author of a, a book called The Leviathan. And um, I wanted to, this is the first time I've done an actual public presentation. I've been on TV a few times and I've done radio interviews and so forth. But this is the first time I've actually had a chance just to talk to folks about the book. Uh, I'm doing it at Riverside for the first time because I feel that I really do owe Riverside. This book could not have been written without the Riverside Public Library. And that, that's a fact, and I'll explain to you why that is. It's due to three librarians. The first is a librarian who, in 1953, bought a book called The Great Iron Ship for the Riverside Library. I don't know who, who her name was, but bless her heart. In 1999, another librarian, whose name I do not know, got rid of the book and put it in the discarded book bin. And my wife, who was a school librarian, bought it out of the discarded book bin for a quarter and gave me the book as a gift. The book was published, as I said, in 1953, and it was a popular history of a ship called the Great Eastern, which I was not familiar with. And it was really quite an amazing story. It didn't cover anything that's covered in my book. But the ship itself had just such a strange background to it that I got interested in after reading the book. So I would go on the internet and I would sort of buy things that related to the Great Eastern. Uh, internet auctions, internet sales, things like that. Uh, newspaper articles, I have some things here that I, I got, which I'll show you afterwards. And so, uh, going through these things, I'm, I'm just kind of, no, no intention of doing anything other than just kind of enjoying myself. I do that, I get interested in things and then I can sort of until it finally it gets boring to me. Well, the ship itself, this is a picture of the ship as it's leaving uh, its original construction site. It's not going on its first voyage at this point. It's simply a test run. This is in 1858. It was far and away the largest ship ever built at that time. It was five times larger than any ship ever built. And I think you can see just by the size of the things, those anchors, for example, are four stories tall. Why was such an enormous ship built? The answer was in the 1840s, they discovered gold in New Zealand and Australia. And they were desperately trying to figure out how to get the Royal Mail contract to do transportation between Australia and the UK. Uh, because that was a very lucrative contract. The problem you had is it took months to sail from England to Australia and back. And a lot of times ships left and you never heard of them again, you never saw them again. So what they did is they decided that they were going to build a ship that was so big, so capacious, that it could carry all of the coal it needed to go to England, from England to Australia and back without once refueling. That's why the ship was so gigantic. Now, ironically, the ship never went to Australia. What happened is it took so long to build a ship that they built the Suez Canal in the meantime. And the ship was too big for the Suez Canal. So what they did then, and of course, with the Suez Canal, they just went in the Mediterranean, went down past India, and went to Australia. So this was a technological wonder I mean, this, this thing was the, the absolute latest of everything. But at that point, it had no purpose. It had no, no functionality. It was originally launched and christened as Leviathan. That's the name of the book. A Leviathan is a biblical sea monster in the book of Job, where it's involved with chaos and evil. Uh, apparently, the marketing department decided that may not have been the best name to name the ship. <laughs> so it became Great Eastern on the grounds that it was going to go east to Australia, which it never did. So this is when it is uh, coming down the Thames to be tried out. The ship had a really, a, as, as I learned, a very dark history during its construction. Uh, it had a full double hull. It was really unsinkable. The ship never did sink. It was completely unsinkable. 
But the course of constructing it, they ended up sealing a boy and a man in the hull. There was wide speculation that that's what happened. They couldn't find these people on the construction site. And of course, they found their, their remains when they finally broke the ship up years later. So knowing that there was a couple people entombed in the ship made it a little bit darker than you might think. On this voyage, the man who designed the ship, who I'll introduce you to, his name is Isambard Kingdom Brunel, a very, very brilliant British uh, engineer, came aboard the ship the day before it was to leave, collapsed. They carried him off, they took him back home. And the idea is, well, well, we'll take you the next time we do our maiden voyage. This ship went out for a couple days. There was a terrible explosion on the deck. It was a steam explosion. It lost one of, it had five funnels. It lost one of the funnels. And in the process, water broke, and they ended up scalding to death a bunch of the men stoking coal in the hull of it. They went then the next day to tell Burnell, who was reconvalescing at home, what had happened and he died the day after. So it was widely assumed that this might be a hoodoo ship. It had an original captain. The captain was actually signed while the ship was under construction. They had a huge contest of 400 captains. <coughs> he was drowned a few feet away from the ship. So it went on and on and on. For those of you who are interested, who like to go to YouTube, Sting did a song about six or seven years ago called the Ballad of the Great Eastern. He did it for a play he was producing called The Last Ship. It was not used in the play. But if you go to YouTube and, and put Sting Great Eastern, you'll get the song. And he goes through the litany of terrible things that happened to him. And he, he concludes in the song that the ship was in fact haunted by the, by the people that got killed by it. So it's not the love boat. <sighs> It, it's on its way. I got interested in it just because just technologically it was so advanced. It was just, just unbelievable. And then, so as I'm buying things, one day I come across this. This is a shell. It's a trochus shell. It's about that tall. It was for sale on eBay by a dealer in Australia. And there's two, actually three renderings on this. The bottom rendering, you can see a profile of a ship. The rendering right above it is this gate with a tree. And then right above it is a pair of crossed wings. When I saw that, I didn't know what to make of it. I, I literally was, was flummoxed. It, it doesn't make any sense. The ship was launched on the River Thames in 1858. Lincoln was buried in Springfield, Illinois in 1865. Lincoln never saw the ship, never was aboard it, never wrote about it, nothing. The owners of the ship never had anything to do with Lincoln. Why were these two things on the shell? Here's the next shot of the shell. This is the writing that appeared on the shell. This says the Great Eastern Steamship, 24,500 tons. This says Tomb of A. Lincoln, President of U.S. There's no writing for those crossed feathers. There's no indication as to what they mean. I wrote to the individual who was selling it out of Australia. It looked like it was kind of a Sanford and Sons kind of operation. I said, what do you know about this thing? And he said, it was brought to Australia many years ago by a, some identified gentleman. That's my second-hand information. Now leave me alone. So I bought it, and, and I have it. It's at home. As I said, it's about tall. This hall is four inches tall. Well, the more I looked at that, this is in 2001 that I bought it, the more I became convinced that somebody was using this to tell of a story or tell an event. And it had to be something that they couldn't tell about in their lifetime, because otherwise it made no sense. The carving on it is, is very professionally done. It's, this is not Scrimshaw or something like this. Somebody had this done for them with a professional engraver. The tomb is not exactly identical to the, to the tomb in Springfield. There was, 
understand, how many people have been to Lincoln's Tomb in Springfield? Okay, it's a huge, tall building. It's on a hill. But where Lincoln was first put was in the back of that hill. There's a gate, and it was called a receiving tomb, and the idea behind it was that during the winter when the ground was frozen, if you died, they would just put you into this, almost like a cave behind a gate, and that's where you'd stay until the ground was thawed out enough that they could bury you. So they put it in a receiving tomb, and that's what is attempted to be portrayed. So this shell was carved probably within a year of Lincoln's death. I'm guessing sometime before the end of 1866. Where it was carved, I don't know, but I think it was carved in England. And uh, so this, this, this is it. This is all the information I have. If there was an event, I thought, that event had to have come in connection with the Civil War. The reason I say that is because other than the Civil War, I don't think anybody in this room would have ever heard of Abraham Lincoln. He was simply a one-term congressman, a, you know, a lawyer in Springfield, that, that's all. So something had to happen uh, with the Civil War. I started researching by going to a database that's maintained by Cornell called The Making of America. And shortly after the Civil War, what happened was that the enormity of what had just happened sank in on a lot of people. And so the government printing office started collecting every shred of paper they could find that related to the war. And they typeset it, and they bound it, and put it in a book. And it's hundreds and hundreds of volumes of, of, of things, and it's just basically letters and correspondence from both the Union side and the Confederate side. Cornell, bless their heart, digitized it, and I could search it. And so I'm searching this vast, vast trove of documents looking for Great Eastern. And I'm finding almost nothing except one thing. On September 9th, 1861, Charles Francis Adams, who was the American envoy to Great Britain, he was our ambassador in Britain, wrote a letter to William Seward, who was Secretary of State. He was summarizing all of the communications he had with the British government, and then he said, quote, I had hoped to send something by Captain Schultz, who returned to the Great Eastern, and I shall yet do so if he should come, if it is, if it should come before the bag closes. That was it. But who was Captain Schultz? I had no idea. But at least it's a name. And so I began looking at it. Well, what I found myself doing is peeling a massive onion with layer after layer after layer. And the more I got into this, the more puzzled I became as to how this thing was set up, what was involved, who these people were. Let me give you a little bit, before I get into that, a little bit more about the ship. This is a man by the name of Isambard Kingdom Brunel. He was five foot five, and they called him the Little Giant. He was widely regarded as the greatest engineer in British history. He's quite well known in the UK. When the Times of London had a contest for the 10 greatest Britons ever, he was on that list. There's a Brunel University in, in the UK and so forth. He designed these soaring railroad bridges that still are used. He built the first tunnel under the River Thames, which is still used. But he was the guy hired to do this ship, and it became his obsession. As I indicate to you, he died uh, almost on the deck of the ship. These chains he's in front of are chains that were used in the launching of the ship. This ship was built before there was electricity, before there was welding. All it was around back then was steam power, hydraulic power. Uh, I, I have a little funny story about him. When I was in London, I, I was there on business, but I also took time to do research. A cab driver asked me what I was doing, and I told him a little bit. He, all of a sudden, this cab driver got very agitated. And I said, what? what's the problem? Well, he related this photograph. He said, in England, they airbrushed the cigar out of his mouth. <laughs> <laughs> 
And I told him, and I told him, I said, well, it's worse than that. I said, if you see this leather strap, that's connected to a wooden box that contains 50 cigars. <laughs> he worked himself to death. He had a large, he traveled around in this large wagon doing his productions, and it was called a, uh, the flying coffin, and that's that's who he was. He was a, was a brilliant, driven individual. Died fairly early on. The ship, more than anything, killed him. This is the ship under construction. That gives you some idea of its size. Now these pictures are woodcuts. They did not have the technology at that time to put photographs on paper. So what was done is they would take a photograph, they would blow it up very large, they would project it on a wall as near as I could figure, and then each they had people who were basically wood carvers, and they would proceed to carve each a brick representing each shape of this thing. And they would do this in like 24 hours. And then when they put it all together, they would bind these bricks up and they would use that and that's what they would print. And so it's an accurate picture, but it's not a photograph. It had two methods of mechanical propulsion. You had paddle wheels on either side that were 60 feet in diameter. And you had a propeller, which to this day is still the largest propeller ever made. This is in the 1850s. It had two separate steam engines, one to run the propeller, one to run the, the paddle wheels. It also had sails, as you can, may recall in the first picture. They didn't use them. They were too big. They weighed too much. This is a major character in the book. To him I came across about two years into the book, as I'm peeling layers away. His name is Ambrose Dudley Mann. He's a Virginian. He was, for many years, the second ranking person in the United States State Department. He had spent his entire adult career in Europe negotiating trade agreements between all these principalities and countries and the United States. He, he was a very important person. If Breckinridge had been elected president instead of Lincoln, he probably would have been Secretary of State. Unfortunately for him, he got caught up in a, in a scandal where a number of ambassadors from the South were in Europe, and they, just, they were plotting to get Spain to give up Cuba. They wanted Cuba as a slave state, so they could pick up two more slave senators. He was not involved with that, but he happened to be loitering in the, in the area. He got caught, and he got thrown out of the State Department. He then became the Assistant Secretary of State for the Commonwealth of Virginia, and he was in it was, it was not anywhere near, obviously, as pre prestigious as being Secretary of State of the United States. But he was in England, and he was, one, trying to sell Virginia products. But two, he was there trying to establish relationships and friendships on behalf of the South with people in Europe, in England in particular. Dudley Mann, interesting guy. People don't know of him right now, but he was a major figure in the 19th century. This is a picture of the ship under construction. This is the River Thames here. You can see a ship there, and it was launched sideways. And it was, it was a huge deal to launch it sideways. They almost couldn't do it. I like this picture because this is what man first saw. This is on the, the River Thames. This isn't a part of the, the uh, of London called the Isle of Dogs. And these buildings are still here. And man was taken there by a friend of his. He, had, he didn't know what this was or what this was about. He was taken there as a friend of his. And he didn't see it because he was blocked, his view was blocked by the buildings. Until the friend said, look up. And he saw this thing. <laughs> And it was shocking, and to him, it was almost a religious revelation. 
he was looking for some way for the South to break clear of New York. Remember, at that time you had what was called the Cotton Triangle. It was the South, New York, England. South, New York, England. The cotton came from the South, but all the money went to New York. And New Yorkers being New Yorkers, they took big chunks of it and then gave a little bit left down to the Southern planters. And there was real animosity about that. And what Mann anticipated was getting this ship and maybe a couple others and using that to shuttle directly between Chesapeake Bay and England and bypass New York. That was his dream. And he wrote a paper called, shortly after seeing this, he wrote a paper, which I have the top here, a letter of A. Dudley Mann to the citizens of the slave holding states regarding weekly Atlantic ferry line of iron steamers of 30,000 tons. This is printed in England in 1856. <clears throat> this was printed as a pamphlet and then was reprinted in the United States and widely distributed. So the, the South was very much aware of this. This was to them a very, uh, a very interesting prospect. There's a picture of it after it's launched. It, as I said, it took months to launch. But finally, it was pushed into the town so they were launching it. This is, it was, this is one of, it fixed up. That was one of the dining rooms. Now, this was not a warship. This was a ship that was intended to go back and forth between the UK and Australia. So it was fairly elegant, as you might guess. And I have some 3D pictures of the interior as well. The idea being that all these folks who just made a ton of money selling gold would, uh, would like to eat pretty well. There's another thing to drink as well. Mm. But that's, that's the beginning. As you, as you may have noticed, this thing has got enormously tall sides. You can see the, you can see the sides of the, the, this thing. This is much, much higher than any ship made today. But it has no superstructure. It doesn't have, if you think about it, all of the rooms were inside the hull of the ship. And all the light was provided by skylights. We had ports. But see the skylights? There's another, you see the skylights. They had these big courtyards. The ship finally got its act together. They didn't know what to do with it. It wasn't going to Australia. So they elected to go to New York on its maiden voyage. So this is what the ship looked like in the maiden voyage. Man, at the meantime, is still trying to negotiate with the Brits. This is in 1860, before the war has broken out. The ship was a huge sensation in New York. That was probably the most fun chapter I had to write as to what was going on in New York at that time, because everything was going on in New York at that time. They were getting ready for the war. I mean, people were getting concerned. But at the same time, the Japanese came for the first time. There was the, the Great Eastern was here. The, the, uh, Edward, the, the uh, Prince of Wales, showed up in New York. I mean, it just, it just everything was going on. And I closed that chapter with a poem by Walt Whitman called The Year of the Meteor, which sums up just about everything that was going up in, in New York was like almost more than you could bear, you know, in terms of all the activities. It was, it was a very, it was a fun chapter to write in that regard. And, uh, but this ship, that was the way it looked. And they, it, people, they were charging people to come on and, and take a look at it. And, 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 the, and they were, the British were very bitter because the Americans, every time they came aboard, they would end up bolting something to off or carrying off a chair or something. So they, you know, they had a hard time dealing with this thing. Another major character of this book, who I do not have any picture for, is the Captain Schultz that I mentioned that Seward referred to. Schultz was the harbor master in New York. So he came aboard it and made acquaintances with the people who owned it and so forth. They became generally familiar with the ship. This is William Seward. Before I get to him, let me explain how Schultz fits into this. This is a family that was literally ripped apart by the Civil War. Schultz was married, uh, married to a, a woman named Evans. 
who was from Wales, and she had a sister, a younger sister, who was also from Wales. They came together. And the two, these two women, the two sisters, were very close. Schultz married Margaret Evans, and a man by the name of Daniel Lober married Mary Evans. Daniel Lober had been a friend of Schultz, and I think it was Schultz who introduced him to his wife. And so this family was very close. Schultz was making pretty good money in New York. He owned a line of tugboats. He was the harbor master. He was very politically connected. Lober's family was a little dicier. They were involved with Tammany Hall and so forth. And Lober was having a hard time making a living in New York. So Lober ended up in New Orleans. They acclimated to the South. Lober became a, not a plantation owner, but he was selling agricultural equipment. But he had a handful of slaves that he owned. And so you had Schultz and his wife who lived on the Hudson River in a town called, today called Beacon. And they're abolitionists. And, and Schultz almost certainly is working in conjunction with the Underground Railroad because it runs literally half a mile from his house up the Hudson. Lober, on the other hand, has become thoroughly a southerner. Between the two of them is Schultz's daughter, Mary, because Mary spends part of the year with the Lober family in New Orleans and part of the year with her family in the Hudson, and she's close to both. It's just absolutely close. And so Mary, who was in her early 20s at that time, is absolutely torn by what is going on as this war is getting uglier and uglier and uglier. She plays a major role in the end of this thing because Lober becomes the means by which the conspiracy to, to break the blockade with the ship is brought into the United States. Seward, when he hears about this, direct Schultz to go to England and to take whatever steps he needed to make sure the ship never came through to a southern port. So if you remember, the letter that was written by Charles Francis Adams to Schultz was dated September 9th. Three days later, the Great Eastern almost sank in the North Atlantic Ocean. Schultz was aboard it. So were other people. The guy who set this thing up, the conspiracy on behalf of the Union, was Seward. Seward and Mann knew each other. They knew each other very well. I mean, Seward had once delivered a speech in the Senate favorable to, to, to Dudley Mann before this whole Civil War thing broke out. Remember, Dudley Mann would have been Secretary of State if Lincoln hadn't won. So Seward is understanding things that Mann has not quite figured out because Seward's arresting everybody. And when he arrests them, they search them and they find letters and documents, and it's all leading to traces. But, but the conspiracy that Mann came up with is simple. The South had secretly entered into a treaty with England called the Declaration of Paris. And it said that if a blockade is not effective, it's not legal. The way you prove a blockade is not effective is you bring a big ship into the port. Clearly, if you bring the biggest ship in the world into a port, that blockade is not effective. Was England prepared to lift the blockade? Yes, it was. It wanted to. There were people there who wanted to dismantle the United States. What they would have done, England's navy was infinitely larger than ours. At the start of the war, we had 40 warships. England had close to 1,000. England could easily have lifted the blockade, and France would have joined in with England, and then come to us and said, we're going to mediate. We're going to recommend a, a mediation. And if you don't accept it, we're going, to, we're going to join in with the South. And the mediation would have been a partition of the United States. It would have been the end of the United States. Seward knew this. And he was determined to do whatever needed to be done. And he's a very interesting guy. I read several biographies of Stuart. And they're all the same. They're literally, you read one, you say, I think I just read this. And you read another. This guy was an utter and complete mystery. But the one thing about Seward is this. If it needed to be done, Seward would do it, whatever it was. And he didn't bother talking to Lincoln about it. Remember, this guy had been governor of New York. He had been 
the United States Senator, this guy was heavy duty. He was the guy who was competing against Lincoln for the presidential nomination. Lincoln won nothing to do with foreign affairs. He was so con concerned and so immersed in the war itself that he just turned everything over to Seward. And so when Seward decided to do something like stop the Great Eastern in the middle of the ocean, Seward never bothered to tell Lincoln. I'm convinced from the Union side, the only people who knew about this conspiracy were Seward, Seward's son, who was his assistant, Schultz, Captain Schultz, a man I'll show you in a minute named Hamilton Towell. And that's about it. It's that small. From the Confederate side, it's not much larger. It's Dudley Mann, it's Daniel Lober, and it's the man who's commanding the ship, an out of, of out of work sea captain who named Walker. So it's a very small conspiracy on either side. This is before they went there. Seward had, was rattling the British, and he was talking about what we're going to do is we're going to get all the Irish in New York, and they're going to join a group called the Fenians, and they're going to invade Canada. And that drove the Brits crazy. Now, Seward's never quoted as saying that, but that story sort of leaked out that this is what Seward's got planned. So they decided to quick send troops. They sent 3,000 troops to Canada. There they are boarding the Great Eastern. So this is before the conspiracy began. This is before the war began. They had 3,000 troops. They had their cannons, their horses. They had stowaways. They had prostitutes. They had everything on this thing at this point. I must have been just a real hoot being on that ship at that time. <laughs> uh, and they, they went up to Quebec. And uh, they had the troops uh, to try to preserve the property. But again, it shows you the immensity of the size of this thing. These are, these are men standing on the, the paddle box up here. So we give you just an idea of just how gigantic this thing was. This is Hamilton Towell. He was one of the Union people on, with Captain Schultz. I was fortunate enough to have a picture of him. It's really hard finding pictures. I, I think the pictures may exist, but they may be with families. And I'm hoping with the publication of the book that maybe people start looking through their attics and stuff like that and start finding things. He was a Harvard-trained engineer. He was only 27 at the time. And he, was, he was in France monitoring French construction of Confederate warships. And Seward indicated that Schultz could contact him and use him. So he was aboard the ship at the time. The ship was three days out. The letter written by, by Adam to uh, Seward was dated September 9th. The ship left September 10th. That letter was written in London. So, so first of all, Schultz had to travel across the entire, he had to travel to Liverpool that day, later that day on the 9th, I think the 9th train was there on the 10th. The 10th is when the ship left. The ship was thrown together a very, very quick voyage. It was totally unplanned. And the idea behind it was to have an unplanned voyage so that the Union could not prepare for whatever was there. They didn't realize that Schultz was in England. Two days out, the ship hits a storm. And it's rocking back and forth. And you can imagine the rocking would be pretty dramatic given the height of the ship. Also, there was no ballast on the ship and almost no, no cargo. It was riding 10 feet higher than it normally would. It gets caught in the storm. A lifeboat gets unloosened ahead of the paddle wheel, unslung, as they said. They don't know how it happened. They can't figure out how it happened, but anyway, they hear it banging against the hull, and it's going to get sucked into the paddle wheel. The captain of the ship orders the 
this lifeboat cut away, but that's taking time, and it can't, it can't stop the paddle wheels. So he orders the propeller to go in reverse, to pull the paddle wheels away from the boat. Remember, this is the largest propeller ever built. It goes in reverse, it pulls the rudder to the side, and it cracks the rudder. So now this ship is caught in the middle of the North Atlantic in a storm. It has no means of steering. It is, as they refer to, a, a log in the trough of the sea for days. This is a picture that one of the newspapers tried to portray of the folks inside. I mean, they are bouncing around inside. They're getting thrown against where people are getting run over by pianos. There were animals on the deck of the ship. That's how they fed people fresh meat. There was no refrigeration back then. So cows were falling in through the skylights. There were swans flying around. I mean, it was a catastrophe. And of course, there was no communication. They couldn't call up anybody. There was no radio or anything like that. So when things settled down a little bit, they, they painted this giant sign, hey, help us, you know, we're, you know, this type of thing. And a canard liner saw them, but couldn't do anything. They're too big, much bigger than the canard liners, but the canard liners, okay, well, we saw that. Well, they continued on to New York where they reported what they saw. Finally, Hamilton Towell, who was involved in this, goes down, he says, I think I could figure this out. He finds a way of fixing the steering mechanism using chains. He says, man, this is a Harvard trained engineer. And they finally are able to get this thing functioning using only its propeller, and they head back to Ireland. And they pull into Queenstown, Ireland, which is now Co-Ireland, and people come and beat off. At that point, this ship was bound for Port Royal, South Carolina, because that was the only port deep enough that it could kink it. There were two deep ports in the south coast. One was Chesapeake Bay, and that was under the protection of these enormous cannons that the Union had set up. And the other one was uh, Port Royal. Well, after this thing went back, the following month, the Union invaded Port Royal with every ship that they had. They took over the port and remained in Union control for the rest of the war. This ship was weeks and weeks and weeks getting picked up. This is the type of lifeboat that's here. And in the book, I have a third man. I have Hamilton Tull. I have Alexander Hamilton Schultz. But there was somebody who got into one of these lifeboats. It basically broke one of the shackles. I'm absolutely convinced that that person died. And I'll tell you why in a little bit. But the question is, who was he? And so I, in the book, I'm very clear. I'm saying, I don't know who he was. But instead of referring to him as Mr. X, and, you know, just, it would make the book unreadable, I concluded, as I did, that it was a fugitive slave. And I did that for a variety of reasons, basically through deduction. It had to be somebody young and very strong and athletic and small. He had, to, he had to move into that thing while that ship was rolling back and forth. It had to be physical strength to break it. It had to be somebody who was anonymous. You couldn't put somebody in this thing and then after this lifeboat is broken away, say, oh, by the way, we lost this American. Because that would raise questions. Well, how did that happen? It had to be somebody who hopefully you could save, somebody who was smuggled aboard in Liverpool and somebody who was smuggled off when they reached Ireland. But if they died, they had to be completely anonymous. There couldn't be any relatives asking for him. What happened to him? Nothing. So I concluded that this was somebody who Schultz met on the Underground Railway and had some relationship with. I gave a name, a Kit. And so Kit is, Kit is in that boat, and he breaks it loose. He could have been pulled aboard, except for one thing, the boat is rocking. And when it rocks out, you swing out. And when it rocks the other way, 
he slammed right back into the metal of the hull, was unconscious. When the crew heard the lifeboat banging against the side of the ship, breaking up, they had no choice but to pull the slip knot and Kit was put in the water. The reason I said he died is because we go back to the shell. If you whip. It took me a long time to figure this out. The wings. I could not find and still have not found anything identical to those wings. But I've talked to people who specialize in Victorian iconography and so forth. But the one thing I realized is that one fairly common symbol that was used on tombstones were crossed wings. And it signified souls ascending to heaven. I believe that shell reflects the death of two people. The person who disabled the ship and President Lincoln. It's somebody, and I don't know who, wanted to record something about this in the hope that someday in the future somebody might realize exactly what went on. When I bought the shelf, I had not intended to write a book. This is the last thing I had thought to do. I wanted to figure out what it was. I just liked reading things. The more I got into it, the more I realized what this was all about. And then it dawned on me, if I didn't write a book, if I didn't summarize this, if I didn't use all of the materials that I had gathered over 15 years, and I mean in dozens of places, I mean I looked in New York, I looked in Ohio, I looked in New Orleans, I looked in Mobile, I looked in London, I looked in Bermuda, I mean I was all over libraries and archives, pulling documents out. If I didn't write what I thought this was all about, then it never would be written. But there were times I was just so ready to, to wrap it up. I mean, 15 years is a long time, folks. And the shell was literally in my library saying, okay, well, what about me? What happens to me? And so finally this year, I retired. I'm semi-retired now. I had the time to finish it, so I published the book. Now, there is a website that, in addition to this book. The website is september1861.com. And that website has got a lot of pictures. It has a 1,200-page document typed which are all of the source documents that I used. There, I don't know how many source documents. It's 6,000, 7,000, it's a lot. There are ship's logs, there are newspaper articles, there's letters, there's telegrams, all of which fit in there. It's a little disjointed, but I have to tell you, it's 528 pages. This is a disjointed story. In that sense, it's one continuous story where the ship is there everywhere. This, this ship is a presence. And while I have Seward versus Dudley Mann, I got Alexander Schultz on Seward's team and Daniel Lober on Dudley Mann's team. The real battle in this book was between Kit and the ship because this is the ship had gotten in. Kit would have remained a slave. He was a fugitive slave. Out in the ocean, he was not a slave. They don't recognize slavery in the open ocean. He was aboard a British ship. So he had to succeed or he would be back there. This is the ship after it was towed into Ireland. It's actually in good shape. I mean, just the, the paddle wheel is destroyed, and the, the lifeboats have all been sheared off, and so forth. But this thing is, this thing is so strong. This thing could have hit the iceberg. 
that, that sank the Titanic, and this thing would have bounced off. I mean, this, it, 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 Brunel made that point. He said, I've, I've built this ship like a bridge. In other words, everything is structurally supported. It was truly unsinkable. After the Civil War, the ship was repaired. An American by the name of Cyrus Field bought it. And he used it to lay the entire transatlantic cable. It was so big, it took the entire cable in its hull. And it was enormously successful as a cable layer. All of the, the evil that had gone into it seemed to disappear after the accident, or whatever it was, after, in my, my view, after Kid's death. It laid cable from the United States to Europe. It laid cable from England to Egypt. It was, it was a cable layer, and it transformed information. One of the things that was hard about this book is that things are happening on both sides that are all separated by two weeks of ignorance. You don't know. That all changed when the cable was laid. After it was finished laying cable, and it's very successful laying cable, it ended up it ended up being a floating shopping mall. Yeah, the restaurants there and trapeze artists and so forth. It wasn't seaworthy anymore. And finally. Many years after it was built, it was towed, broke it up, and that's where they found the remains. It was, it's, it's, it was a ship that was 60 years ahead of its time. These are, these are pictures you can see, contemporary pictures of the ship. It was, just, it was just in every kind of journal. One of the things I really enjoyed about this book is Mary Schultz's daughter, the one who was torn between New Orleans and New York, she ended up marrying her first cousin's widower. She was very close to her first cousin. And he, he was a cotton dealer in New Orleans. So she moved to New Orleans. And I actually went by her house, which is now owned by Tulane. It's a beautiful house in the uh, Garden District. And uh, every year, Tulane gives an award for the best watercolor, which is the Mary Lober Schultz Award without any idea who she was, just that without her name. It, I've read so many of their letters, so much of their material that, that I feel it, maybe not that I know them, but I think I know them as well as anybody is ever going to know them. You know, the families have pretty much dissipated. I have not tried to find anybody who's still alive. I hired genealogists to help make the connections for a lot of this, but I pretty much ran into dead ends about 1920. And so I couldn't find anybody that, that survived it. So it's an unusual story. It's the person who did not want to write a book ended up writing a book. Uh, it, I have, I have, I've got a very cool, I have that three dimension, I'll give it to you. I have a, I don't know if you're familiar with one of these. Folks know what this is? Stereopticon. This was really popular for Stereopticon, so I have a number of. Hey, yeah, when you come up, I'll, I'll I'll put some slides in for you. You can see you can see some of the features of this ship, three dimension. That's the way it was painted. This is all artificial. This was just solid back here, nothing. But they said, well, we'll put some painted windows in and so forth to make it look a little prettier. And they said, there there was nothing pretty about this ship. This is the interior. The interior of the ship was, was high Victorian, but it was hardly ever used. This ship could take 3,000 passengers, or as a troop carrier, could take 10,000 troops. It never had anywhere near that number, but it first made its initial voyage, it had 32 passengers. <laughs> yeah, it never had any more than three or 400 at most. Which. I think you could understand, you know, we're going to go on a ship that was christened the Leviathan, and by the way, it's killed all sorts of people and almost sank. And so the ship just keeps going. There's a group of people standing on one of the paddle boxes. Well, thank you very much for coming. Thank you.